Hello and welcome to this Revision Monkey video. As we're so close to the exams, I thought I'd put together my top tips to help you in your GCSE science exams. Tip number one. This one may sound trivial to you, but it's something that you should definitely not overlook. Last year, one in three people did not tick the right number of boxes on a tick box question. Make sure that is not you in this exam series. So look carefully, they'll have the number of boxes that need to be ticked in bold. It might be one, it might be two, or it may be even three boxes that you need to tick. But look really carefully so you don't throw away those easy marks. Tip number two. This again is to do with how you're answering questions because so many people get this wrong. When they see a question like this where it says draw one line from each type of drug to the correct use, they miss that key fact there that you just need to draw one line. So many people start thinking that you've got to join all of them up somehow and it gets really messy. That's not what the examiner wants. They want just one line from each type of drug to the correct answer, for example, antibiotics treating bacteria and painkillers treating symptoms of the disease. Make your lines really clear as well so that they meet the boxes. A lot of people make it a little bit vague by doing something like that. That's not clear enough. Okay, make sure the boxes join up properly. Tip number three, do not write the words it or they in the exam. If you're writing the words it or they, it will probably mean that you've missed out a key word and you will not get the mark. For example, if we look at this question, it says gonorrhea is treated by antibiotics. Measles cannot be treated by antibiotics. Explain why. If you simply put it is a virus and they are used to treat bacteria, not viruses, I can tell from that that you do understand the answer to the question. However, because you use the words it and they, it is likely that you won't get any marks. So don't be lazy, put in as many key words as you can and just put measles is a virus rather than it and antibiotics are used to treat bacteria, not viruses. A simple correction that's going to make sure that you get the marks. Tip number four. Use comparative words when you're asked to compare things in questions. For example, don't just write high, write higher or faster or thinner. Making sure when you're comparing two things, you are using these type of words. For example, if you're asked to compare the structure of arteries and veins, you can put, for example, arteries have thicker walls than veins. Arteries have more muscular walls than veins. Some of the comparisons won't apply. For example, if you're saying a statement like this, veins have valves, whereas arteries do not. And in this case, you, you can use the whereas words to link them up. And this one here, veins have larger lumen than arteries. OK, so that's what the examiner is looking, at, looking for. And you'll see in the mark scheme, if you looked at mark schemes before, that these comparative words have the, the endings underlined to make sure that you are actually comparing. Tip number five. Again, we're going to look at a compare question, but this time when the question gives you data in a table or a graph. And in this case, my advice would be to include simple calculations in your answer. For example, here we've got a table with some different size solar panels and a few things about the solar panels that we can compare. The question says compare the solar panels and use data from table one. Now many of you would think to write a simple statement like this. The smallest solar panel costs £400, the medium costs £600 and the largest costs £6,000. And then you might do the same for power output and lifespan. However, listing it like this is not what the examiner wants because they've asked you to compare they're going to expect you to do simple calculations to show that you've compared them. For example, instead we could write the medium solar panel costs 1.5 times more than the smaller solar panel and the large solar panel costs 10 times more than the medium solar panel. So we've done simple calculations to compare these. 
rather than just listing their costs. And you could do the same for power output and lifespan. You could say that the lifetime of the medium one was five times bigger than the small one and the large one was two times bigger than the medium one. You could do other things to compare them as well. Um, for example, seeing how many watts you get per pound, for example. So for this small one, you would do your 40 watts divided by 400 pounds, and that will give you an answer of 0.1 watts per pound. And then you could compare that to the other two as well. For example, the medium one would be 50 over 600 and that would only give you 0.08 watts per pound and then that will help you in your choosing of the solar panel that you want to buy. So simple calculations are what the examiner are looking for in this answer when you are comparing data. Tip number six. In the exam you may be asked to draw a line of best fit on a scatter graph. Now this can be either a straight line or it can be curved. You just need to make sure that the line goes as close to as many of the points as possible. So this one looks like a straight line relationship. So you would draw your line as close to as many of the points as possible like so. However, this one, it would be wrong to try and put a straight line relationship through when clearly the relationship is that of a curve. Draw a smooth curve as close to as many of the points as possible. And the same kind of idea for this one. Don't join the dots, I can't do it very smooth on the computer, but don't join the dots at all, okay? We're just drawing a smooth curve through the points. You may well see graphs like this as well with a completely different relationship. And again, you just do a smooth curve like so on the graph. Now in the exam, if you get the graph wrong by plotting the points wrong or drawing the line of curve, line of best fit wrong, you will not be able to get a new paper or a new graph or anything like that. So do take your time um, and draw it as accurately as possible. Tip number seven. When writing a method, write down the equipment you are using, the variables and repeats. So you can write this within the method, you don't have to list it before. Um, you can write it within the method, however you must make sure that you are listing absolutely everything you're using. So take this required practical for example, where you change the distance between the lamp and the pondweed and measure the rate of photosynthesis, either by the number of bubbles produced per minute or you could perhaps get a, a gas syringe on there if you wanted to. Anyway, if we're writing a method, we're not going to go through the whole thing, but I'll highlight the, the key points that I want you to include. So in the method, I've just highlighted a bit of good practice. Um, first of all, in the pink here, making sure you're saying what your independent variable is and actually listing the, the values that you are going to use for that. Stating that it is the independent variable as well. So here I've put the distance between the lamp and pondweed is the independent variable. That just makes it really clear to the examiner that you know what it is and you've included it. I've done the same up here when I talked about cutting a length of pondweed and putting it in water. I've just added, to make it really clear, the length of pondweed is an important control variable. I'm just making it stand out to the person that's marking it. Again here, I've made sure I mention in green all the equipment I've used. Pondweed, boiling tube, ruler, lamp stopwatch okay so even when I'm talking about measuring a distance I'm making it clear that I'm using a ruler so write it as if you're writing to a younger child and you're including every single piece of equipment that you're using and I've added here about the fact that I know what the dependent variable is I've said record the number of bubbles produced by the pondweed in one minute and I've just added this is the dependent variable where appropriate, it is also really important to say about the fact that you're going to do repeats and calculate a mean. So I've said I'm going to repeat it three times for each distance and calculate a mean. And I've just put some further information about control variables here, making it clear to the examiner that I know what they are and have explained how I'm going to keep those constant. So do expect, if you have a method in question in the exam, do expect it to take quite a long time to write it out in full and detail. You're going to want to spend close to 10 minutes actually writing out the method in the detail that you need to get full marks. Tip number eight. 
for evaluate questions, give advantages and disadvantages for each subject and finish with a justified conclusion. So, for example, here we've got a question that says evaluate the use of stents and statins to treat cardiovascular disease. So some of these evaluate questions may well come with half a page or so of information, of text to read or of data in tables. And in that case, you can use your comparative skills that we discussed about earlier, using the comparative words and perhaps simple calculations to help with your evaluate response. Or you may well have one that it requires you to, to recall some knowledge from the course and perhaps include your own knowledge as well. So if we were answering this evaluate question, we need to make sure we're doing advantages and disadvantages for stents and statins and then writing ourselves a conclusion, which is saying which is better and why. So I would recommend making it really clear to the examiner when you're writing an advantage and when you're writing a disadvantage to show them that you're building up that balanced argument. So putting several down, at least two down, advantages and disadvantages for stents and then again at least two advantages and disadvantages for statins and the final thing that you would need to do is write a justified conclusion. Now there's no right or wrong here as long as you justify why you've come to your conclusion that is what the examiner is looking for. So I've made it really obvious again that I'm writing my conclusion by putting in conclusion I think that statins are best because it is better to try to reduce cholesterol to prevent the build-up build up of fatty deposits rather than relying on stents when the fatty deposits have already built up. Tip number nine. For all of the exams that you do, always make sure that you show all your working and do each calculation twice and always do it on the calculator. Don't rely on your brain in the exam, even if it's a simple one to check for mistakes. So for example, if we have a simple calculation, which is the type of thing you'd expect in the exam, calculate the mean for the results below. Many people would just do it on their calculator and perhaps come out with an answer, okay? However, if this answer is wrong, which it is, you would get no marks. So perhaps you just put a wrong number in the calculator and you've ended up with a wrong answer. You get zero out of the two marks. However, if you take the time to show the examiner that you are going to do the calculation as 10 plus 13 plus 12 plus 15 divided by 4, even if you got the answer wrong, you would have got one mark for showing you're working out. So it's really, really important that you do that. So the real answer of that would have been 12.5. And as an extra little tip, when you calculate a mean, you should always round it to the same number of decimal places as the numbers that you were given. So as this is 12.5, we would need to round it up to 13 seconds so that it's the same number of decimal places as above. Tip number 10. My final tip goes for any of the papers that you do. Look at the marks awarded for calculations because they may give you a little clue about what you need to do. So as a general rule, um, one or two mark calculations will be simple calculations like calculating means or putting numbers into an equation that you are given. You may well have to rearrange an equation for that. OK, it's not hard and fast rule. You may well have a rearrangement in there, but they'll be quite simple calculations. If you look at the calculation and it's three or four marks, have a look just to check you don't need to do anything else, like uh, rearrange the equation, perhaps putting the number in a particular number of significant figures, and they'll give you that in the question. Do you have to give the unit for the answer for the calculation that you've just worked out? And perhaps is there one of those nano, micro, millis, kilo, mega, gigas, kicking around in the question that you will need to convert first of all. And then finally, this is unlikely in the foundation paper, but in the higher paper, especially in the chemistry and the physics, have a look out for five or six mark calculations, and that might be an indicator, indication that multiple equations are needed. So you might need to work out one thing first and then put it into another equation. So I hope you found those top 10 tips useful. 
And all that's left to say is really good luck for your exams.